you're black. And I was like, no, I'm mixed. I'm both. And he's like, well, look at your skin. You're not white. They'll I'm usually like, say, okay, according um, to you, and ask if I'm Native American or uh, Mexican, and I say, uh, no, I'm from Trinidad. As I was growing up, my parents tried to keep me as American as possible so I could be accepted by the Americans, but it turns out Americans really don't accept you. I think um, what is happening you know, in, in, in America is um, it's affecting a lot of people because a lot of people are now, you know, I mean, reconsidering. Imagine you've done everything right your entire life. Studied hard, worked hard, maybe even graduated at the top of your class, only to suddenly face the threat of deportation to a country that you know nothing about, with a language that you may not even speak. That's what gave rise to the DREAM Act. It says that if your parents brought you here as a child, you've been here for five years, and you're willing to go to college or serve in our military, you can one day earn your citizenship. We live anxiously from day to day, looking for land that this wretched journey would be over. So if someone would go lean over the side and peer in the distance and see perhaps a cloud and then holler, land, land, terra, terra, and we would all rush there and it was just an illusion. So back we went. And so when we finally reached uh, the harbor and um, uh, I, I don't remember that anybody even noticed the Statue of Liberty. I'm not sure that anybody knew there was such a statue there. All we knew is that we were in port. During the 19th and early 20th century, the door to the United States was open to everyone, so most of the immigrants arrived in the United States not looking to make a fortune, but to find work that would allow them to survive. And they stayed and built their families. However, at the turn of the 20th century, immigration reached its peak. More than 12 million people came through Ellis Island, most having traveled steerage, not in very sanitary ship. On arrival, they faced physical examination to ensure that they did not carry communicable diseases, and an interview to determine that they were not anarchy and would not become a public charge. They ask you questions. How old you are, where are you going to? And then another question, are you an anarchist? At that time, if you were an anarchist, I don't know why it's now. 65 years ago, they, this was a question, and you had to answer them, yes or no. If you said yes, I'm an anarchist, they can come into the United States. Of course, I told them I'm not an anarchist, but I'm, I hope I'll be a very good citizen for America. And, and, I, and I love America if I'll enter it. Well, my mom came before I did. She came to the U.S. when I was about three or four years old, and she paved the way for several of her siblings and for me to come. The conditions were, were tough. We weren't the poorest, but we were poor. Um, and when we came, we moved to Brooklyn when I came. She sent for my grandmother and I, my little brother, and we were brought to Brooklyn, New York, and I remember that was the first time I ever felt cold. I d didn't know what the feeling was like, and um, the first time I had flown in an airplane. Because I, I remember when I first uh, came to this country, uh, United States in 1972, you know, I mean, the very next morning, you know, my, my family, they had to go to work, so I said, I, I've got to go walk around and see this place. And, um, and they said, Ron, make sure that you, you have your landmark because you can easily get lost in this place. So I'm walking down the street in Brooklyn, and I'm walking there, and I see Dog Doodoo on the sidewalk. I said, Doodoo? I said, you go to, you see the movies and everything is so pristine and you I could not imagine that there was dog filth on the streets of Brooklyn. You know, so, so even that uh, uh, simple analogy, 
you know, it gives you uh, the wrong impression that, you know, that it could be a bed of uh, roses just on paper. But when you come here, it could be a horse of a different color. For me, I had heard in Haiti that America was a land that was completely clean and beautiful and you could find gold on the streets and everything was going to be wonderful. And so I, like many other immigrants, thought about the American dream. And as a child, I thought of it more concretely. What I ended up coming into, though, was a situation of a mom that worked very hard. Even though she'd been a professional in Haiti, she had to work doing house cleaning here while she continued her schooling here. And the situation of actual um, abuse at the hands of her stepfather. So for me, it was an American nightmare. There was nothing wonderful about it. Being born here and uh, being raised in the, in the Haitian Heritage household is very challenging. Um, with the structure of the United States and the way my parents um, raised us to be, we didn't have um, parents that were able to sit on a table with us and help us study or to understand when we bring home a paper, what does it mean, or PTA meeting. We didn't have that. So it was challenging because we had to be our own PTA parent, student, um, and our own supporter because our parents' main focus was about um, working hard to you know, create a household. And it was also tough for them because of their language barrier. So they really couldn't help us with math um, and reading and stuff like that. Um, and then the, um, the school's notices when we got home. It was our responsibility to say, hey mom, there's a PTA meeting next week, can you make it? No, ask your dad. Dad, there's a PTA meeting. No, I'm working. You know, so it was always a challenge because their uh, structure at home was way different. Their thoughts and their belief was so different than what the American family intended it to be. The number of Caribbeans who migrated to the United States increased dramatically during the first three decades of the 20th century. The foreign-born black population increased from 20,000 in 1900 to almost 100,000 by 1930. Despite the restrictive immigration laws intact in 1924, Congress passed the National Origins Act, creating a quota system. When we moved here, Sarah Jashil was uh, 15 years old, so his personality and um, his culture was basically set already. Uh, Jared moved here with us, but we, he actually had to go back and forth to Belize for a number of reasons. Uh, one being that, you know, it was just us. We had no family here, so Jashil and I had to, you know, battle it out for a little bit. Um, Jared was in Belize like six months out of the year, so um, he was still being raised under the Belize culture. Um, Jashil, he actually is he's very strong-minded. Uh, he knows the culture, he loves the culture, so it was really easy for him. He adapted very easily. I, I mean, I had no trouble at all with him. Being in America and always being surrounded by American ways, uh, you really have to balance it out because you lose, sometimes you lose where you're from, your background, as in terms of <laughs> speech, foods you eat, you know, you go out there, you're always buying foods and everything, um, the way you talk, just like, not, not like accents, but just everything, it just changes and and I find it that when I'm out there, when I leave this door, I become a little bit Americanized. I sound like them. To me, I do. I don't think. I think I sound like them. But when I'm at home and the doors are closed, then I can't speak English unless, you know, like to my mom or my brother, I can't. It sounds so weird. My name is Christy Josh and I was born in Haiti in November 8, 1994. I came here when I was four years old. My life in Haiti, the only thing I could remember because I was so young was say peaceful and gorgeous to me. The only thing I remember was the beach, um, going to get patas with my cousin and I don't know why, I just remember coming from school and smashing my finger on the gate. And it was kind of painful.
my cultural identity um, is it's a part of who I am and it's based on where I come from which is then where my ancestors come from so cultural identity identity to me is a positive thing um, it's exciting to me because my background is so diverse and the more we research the more we look into the more mixed we see it is you know my, like for example my mother and I were looking into her father's side of the family which she's not as familiar with and um, we found Dutch and Portuguese um, descent mixed in there we found out um, there's you know native Arawak in the bloodlines, which is why her father was so, so tall. And um, we also found, you know, on my father's side, like uh, primarily Irish and German, but there's some English in there. And if I'm not mistaken, there's some Polish. So just seeing how cultures interact and blend over time based on wars and conquests and explorations or natural disasters that force people to move, that historical and even scientific aspect is really interesting to me and is a positive thing. Culture clash obviously has a negative connotation and it evokes those sorts of feelings and thoughts in me like being pointed out by a peer and like you're, you're not black but you're not white so where are you and your, your skin is black so why don't you act black enough for me? to feel comfortable with how you are, or you know, an adult saying you don't really fit in anywhere, why don't you feel weird about that? Culture clash, culture identity means so much because um, I, which that this is probably rare in Haitian culture, but I did marry um, a man who is African American, who's not Haitian. So I have my Haitian identity to uphold and his African American identity to embrace. Um, so it, it, it's just, it's a lot. Um, like you, you're in America and you try to uphold American cultures and assimilate to that lifestyle, but yet you're still trying to hold on to your Haitian roots. So it's just, you, you have a lot going on. And when people try to label you, they kind of have a hard time. It's like, you're not black, you're Haitian. Well, I am black and Haitian, but does black have to be synonymous with African-American? Black is black. <laughs> like there are a lot of people from different Caribbean backgrounds that are black. So with black often being synonymous with African American, it's kind of like where do you fall when you check off the box? Sometimes I check off African American <laughs> when you have the little box and those are the only options you have. Or if you have an other box when you fill out a form, sometimes you'll check out other and write Haitian. So it's just trying to find out where you fit in. Um, almost like what when W.E.B. Du Bois talked about the the duality like of African Americans having to try to hold on to the African roots but yet still try to assimilate and grow in the American culture it's like you're dragging your past while pushing forward to the future it's it's just it's a lot of weight to bear but you do it proudly every day because you have no choice <laughs> It is who you are, and, and, and it is the life that you have to live. There's, a, there's an experience that I had um, as an actor. It was a Citibank commercial, and they were looking for a Caribbean man. And I auditioned for this, um, this commercial in New York. And my agent called me and said, Ron, you know, we booked the commercial. I said, right on. He said, it's shooting in St. Thomas. I said, well, it's all right. We get to St. Thomas, Jean Rene, and I'm greeted here. Oh, Mr. Bob Semple, you know, welcome to St. Thomas. You know, uh, uh, we've got an itinerary for you, and uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Mr. Eric Zucker, uh, your voice coach, will be picking you up at the hotel. Eric Zucker. Now, I won this commercial in New York City, and I'm now in St. Thomas. So I said, okay, well, you know, I'll go along with the go along. So the next morning, this Jeep pulls up in front of the hotel, you know, I get into the Jeep, you know, introduce myself, as he said, I'm Eric Duke. I said, I'm Ron, blah, blah, blah. And while driving to the set, he turns to me, he said, Ron, uh, uh, do you speak Calypso English? I said, what? I said, man, I talk anything. Now here it is, they have hired this white man, well, Eric Zucker, that's why I was, 
uh, overemphasizing the name Eric Zucker. Now, they've hired this white man as my voice coach, as a Caribbean man. The character is a Caribbean man. And I told him, I said, Eric, man, I hope you're getting paid because what is it that you can teach me that is innate, that I have, I'm born with, this is a part of me, which is the reason why I won the commercial. You weren't there in, in, uh, in New York to assist me in getting this job. But now they've got to hire somebody so that the books would show that there's a voice coach. So we got on the set and the director said, Eric, do you and guys, you and Ron get together? He said, yes, yes. Yes, he read the spot, I read the spot, and everything is fine. Now he's gotten credit as being my voice coach on that commercial. First I ran for about three years. I'm saying that to say that, that, that here it is, on, on the reverse, it would never happen. It would never happen. And, you know, I, I really felt insulted that the man is going to, what is Calypso English? I mean, he's so ignorant to ask me Calypso English. What is that? About my experience in school was extremely negative in the beginning. At, well, at first they, they were fascinated. They had no idea where Haiti was, the students and some of the teachers. And um, they called me Frenchy because my mother said, just tell them you speak French. Um, because they want to understand Creole, just say you French. And so they said, okay, Frenchy, 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 and I was threatened. Um, there were many times because I couldn't speak English. My mom gave me a quarter one time to buy snacks during snack time. And I put it in my desk thinking that's where it is. Well, a student went by and she took the quarter and when I tried to take it from her, she explained to the teacher for what I could, the best I could understand, that I had taken her quarter. And the teacher came to me and pointed her finger in my face and said, you should not steal. And I was crying and she yelled at me for crying for something that wasn't mine, but it was my quarter. That was just the first of many incidents where books were taken from the library or oh, I t signed a book out, but a student took it from my desk and took it home, and then I was punished, and the teacher said, no more stealing. And so I was watched constantly as a child who had some sort of irresistible urge to steal other people's property. And so all those factors really pushed me to learn English really fast. By the time I was in, I, they put me in fourth grade when I started. By the time I was in sixth grade, I was a spelling bee champ. And I had learned English extremely well. I said to myself, I need to learn English fast and well so I could stop being accused of things. You know, because in Haiti they tell you if you steal, you could kill. So there was a huge taboo against kids stealing. I'd never stolen anything and I was constantly being accused um, of being a thief. So yeah, it was not a good experience in the educational system. American youth don't know what the immigrants at that time had to go through when it comes in a land, a strange land, good land, but they have no you can talk. You don't know what people are talking to you, and you don't know what you ask them, and, and you're lost. But gradually, I overcome that. I went to the night, night schools, and I started to learn English, and read and write, and I made a nice living by being a peddler, and I was very happy, and I always said, God bless America. The America is good to the
we get along well with each other, but at the same time, you hear things like, you never trust the Guyanese, you never trust the Pakistani, you leave the Muslims alone, you know. Um, you hear all these things and you're able to observe them. When I moved to United States, I, there were times I would uh, come across an Indian. Uh, recently, I remember passing by the Hindu temple while there were services there, and I was just walking the street, passing by, and a gentleman just started, came up to me with a big smile on his face, and he started speaking to me in Hindi. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. And he just got this grimace on his face, said something, and turned and walked away. And it's just one of those things where if you not from India directly, they don't respect you. So I just started going up and just saying, you know what, I'm not a real Indian. I just look Indian. College, everybody, not everybody, but a lot more people knew where Guyana was. They. I went to USF, so it was more, it was very diverse in terms of, you know, people coming in. Uh, they had a large Caribbean population there. Uh, and as you, as I started, you know, I became in, into this, I got used to the school, I started making more friends. And from there, I just, you know, I ended up coming more into my culture than in high school or, you know, it, like, I just, became to understand my culture even more because there's a lot more international students who I became friends with and from there I started you know understanding a lot more about my culture. We were going to move to this really nice place in Davie, Florida and I made the phone call. I spoke with the woman on the phone and I said to her, oh I see you have an apartment available and she was all excited, well sweetheart just come on when your husband comes home from work we'll be happy to show it to you. I guess she didn't know I was black on the phone. And so we get there and um, my husband and I pull up and he gets out of the car and then I step out and the woman stopped approaching. She said, oh dear. And I was like, oh no, did you rent it already? He said, let me speak to you for a minute, son. And he called my husband over. And then my husband listened to her and then got in the car and said, okay, let's go. I said, what happened? Did she rent it? You know, and he said, um, no, she told us that you wouldn't have any friends here. I said, I don't need friends. I need an apartment. You know, we had just moved, we had just gotten married, just moved to Florida, 1981. And she said, um, he told me that she had told him that I would not find friends. There was no other black person around there. And not only that, but the KKK held their meetings in, her, in their clubhouse. And so I wouldn't be comfortable and they wouldn't like it either. I said, turn around. I'm gonna to talk to her, I have some things to say to her. I was so angry because I had spoken with somebody who welcomed me on the phone, but once they saw me that I was black, it was a problem. Growing up, we were always around other Caribbean Americans, so we we're always proud to be Haitian. I know individuals had different experiences in probably different states or in different neighborhoods, but in North Miami, you were always proud to be a Haitian, despite the fact that a lot of us didn't even speak Creole well, um, you know, we had Haitian flags during Haitian Flag Day. We would put on our Haitian hats. Um, as a matter of fact, when I was a, a younger kid, one of my middle school um, um, teachers at North Miami Senior High School, it was a history teacher, and he, um, at that time, we were discussing, I think, American history, and, and everyone, I remember getting up, individuals were being asked, to tell the class, I mean, what are they? Are you a Hispanic? Where you're from? Are you this? Are you that? And I remember getting up saying I'm Haitian American, and the and the professor, the teacher was like, "Oh, so you were born in Haiti?" And I was like, "Well, no, I was born here." But um, in the, in the, for the first time ever, my teacher said, "No, there's a difference. If you weren't born in Haiti, you can't consider yourself Haitian American. You can consider yourself of Haitian descent, but you're American. You you were." But, you know, I kind of disagreed with him, but that, so at the time, I didn't really know of a conflict. We, we, I didn't even know a conflict really exists. I kind of, uh, for some odd reason, it was uh, harmony. I would say my circumstances and uh, my transitions from coming to the United States 
were very easy and difficult at the same time. Everything was new to me. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what were people were talking about. I didn't understand the language. And it was, you know, kind of intimidating. Here it is. Yeah, you've, you've come into, um, in, into a, a melting pot that, that, is, that is throwing so many things at you constantly, you know, even down to clothing. You know, in the Caribbean, you, you have one set of clothes, maybe two sets of clothes because of the weather. You know, you come to America or to London or to Canada and you, you've got to think about, you know, in spring clothing, winter clothing, you know, summer clothing. And it's, it's a whole different um, uh, uh, society, of course. I am not a Belizean. I am American. Jared, on the other hand, um, there's a little bit of a challenge with him. You know, he's in the U.S. system uh, since birth, more or less. He's been to um, VPK, daycare, and a lot of the stuff that they tell him and you know like he came home once to tell us that if we spank him he's gonna call 911 because that's what his teacher told him to do you know so I had you know it's a lot of a challenge for me to try to explain to him and try to guide him that certain things that you know people think that are acceptable here is not acceptable in our culture so I mean I'm still working along with him he's a little bit of a challenge Immigrant children and children of immigrant parents from the Caribbean often struggle with two cultures without fully identifying with either group. They come to know the norms, values, and customs their parents promote on one hand and those promoted by American culture on the other hand. These two cultures are often viewed as opposing each other, a situation which is culture clash. In the Haitian culture, people who have dreads, pierced ears, goals in their mouth, tattoos, etc., were considered as vagabonds. Vagabonds um, would be considered as thugs. To be honest with you, um, I got it to the point where I, I used to have braids, and she would give me all kind of grief about it. Um, you need to cut it. And young men are supposed to have haircuts, and et cetera, et cetera. But um, I started um, reversing that on her because some of her favorite artists, especially in music, were people like Bob Marley, um, Gregory Isaac, um, Bukan Guine, uh, Casey from um, Kujai. And I was like, Mom, so what's the difference between those guys? And they have dreads and they're doing positive things and versus me. And um, it was funny because she finally had a boyfriend, <laughs> can't believe I'm saying this, that had dreads. So once I started growing my dreads, she kind of like eased back with it because she seen it was like, she started getting, a, I want to say Americanized. She started seeing that, you know, having dreads don't consider you as being um, a thug or anything. Um, Growing up, I really didn't have sleepovers because Haitians are like really strict on things like that. And it's more of just, it's like within the home itself, there's just, it's just all Haitian culture, everything. Like everything that you're doing is according to like some type of Haitian guideline. But outside of it, it's more like you step out into America. It's like you leave little Haiti that's inside the house and step out into America. So, yeah. I joined a Indian dance group. There wasn't conflict within the group, but there was conflicts, you know, outside of the group. It was other people making a statement of, well, she's not from India, she's not from there. No, I mean, I knew I wasn't, but it was just, I loved the music. I grew up with Bollywood, even if I'm from Guyana, or my parents are from Guyana. I still love the music, I grew up dancing to it, so when I started performing it, a lot of the group was fine with it. It was outside of it. A lot of people were making the comments that, oh, she's not from, you know, India. I don't know why she's doing it. And just stuff like that. 
in Trinidad every Sunday afternoon there was a TV show called Mastana Bahar where it was basically an Indian culture sh show and even though I didn't I cannot speak a word of Hindi I used to we used to watch that show religiously so I got to know my Indian culture and now my children know nothing about their Indian culture. They don't even know what the Indian flag looks like. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. So it, it, I have to be more purposeful when it comes to giving them um, training in their cultural history. In ninth grade, uh, my geometry teacher asked me to stay after class one day. Um, and he said he wanted to ask me a couple of questions because he was writing a paper for school. He said he was doing his master's, I think. Um, and now looking back on it, I think he may not have been writing a paper, but really just wanted to ask. Uh, maybe he was, you know, God only knows. But he asked me what it's like growing up, you know, mixed with a, with a black mom and a white dad. I didn't know how to answer his question. Um, because it's normal. That's like asking, what is it like to be you? I don't, I don't know, I've been me all my life. Like it just, it's normal to me, you know, but obviously it's different to you. So, you know, my wheels are starting to turn and I don't, I don't really know how to answer your question. It just, it's normal, it's fun. I have great parents, you know? And he's like, well, you know, it must be strange because you don't really fit in, you know, because you're not black, but you're not white. So what is that like? And, and that, you know, hearing that, perspective from the outside. It's not, not a way, again, that I'd ever really seen myself. And I didn't carry that experience with the boy in middle school my whole life, like, oh, I don't fit in anywhere, you know? I experienced it and it was difficult and I learned from it and I was a kid and I moved on, you know? There was never really a conflict. My mom assimilated to America very well while keeping, obviously, her Haitian American roots. And that's why I can speak Creole today and I spoke Creole growing up. Not well, mind you, but I spoke the language because my mom made sure that we learned how to speak the language and she spoke the language with us and she spoke English with us as well. So in terms of conflicts between being, I guess, American, living in America, being raised by Haitian parents or parents who were born in Haiti, I, I didn't really see a conflict at all. It, it all it, it all worked out well think, thanks to my mom who assimilated very well to America while at the same time making sure that we did not forget our, um, I guess, Haitian American heritage. And my mom is Trinidad, Indian, and American, and my dad is American and German. With my friends at school, um, they don't e I don't even mention to them what uh, I would say, uh, Culture. culture I am and um, they usually ask if I am uh, when they do ask if I'm from somewhere else they'll usually say um, am, ask if I'm Native American or uh, Mexican and I say uh, no I'm from Trinidad and uh, a few years ago I started mentioning German too because I didn't know that a few years ago. When, when they ask me that, they usually just are surprised because they don't really see German or Trinidadian in me. They mostly see Indian. Many Caribbean American children at times find themselves in hostile and abusive environments because of their heritage and where their parents come from. In Miami and other major cities, Caribbean students at schools are bullied and discriminated against by other young African Americans. It's when I got to high school, um, early 90s was the roughest time for a young man, a young Haitian man to be in school. Um, you would constantly get teased, um, 
that will say that, you know, your parents smell like saltwater fish, uh, your parents came out the banana boat, etc. Um, it even got to the point where every day after school we found ourselves um, pretty much defending our culture. Um, it would be a big fight between the Americans and the Haitians. So every day after school at 2.30 p.m. you were expected to ready to commence into a battle between the Americans and Haitians. And um, at that time, that's um, because I grew up in Little Haiti in Miami. Um, that's when Zopound started to um, evolve. They had a they had a beat up day for Haitians and um, one for Jamaicans and one for Latin. So it wasn't so easy to really admit that you were Haitian. A lot of the students were afraid because that also meant you weren't popular or also meant that um, you know you were different. So um, dealing with that in school and then going home and dealing with our parents also instilling something different in us was definitely one of the things I consider challenging in high school. Um, and our, our, our friends would, would, would pursue a lot of things, like they were involved in a lot of different activities. Um, and and, and um, they, there was something called um, on, onboard travel, where these students were, were able to travel during the summer to places like Europe and stuff. And our parents wouldn't allow it, not only because they, didn't, they didn't, couldn't afford it, but also their thought was, you stay home and you help us in the house. You do chores. Um, and then, you know, you, you, you assist us in the house. Um, I remember getting into fights or having to fight people because we um, had a funny last name. Um, and it was so weird when you, as an adult, when you think of how, how cognitive kids are at the age of, we were so young, we were probably in the first, second grade. I remember coming to school and having a fight um, because I had a, a French last name, a Haitian last name. When Haitians come to the U.S., I think in any enclave that you have Haitians, you have conflict with the dominant culture because the dominant culture changes from one community to the other. If they move into a Caribbean community, there's sometimes a sense of cohesiveness and there's sometimes a sense of, of conflict. Um, I think that depending on who the host culture is in the neighborhood, that determines the degree of conflict and what that conflict, conflict looks like. Um, within, I would say, um, white America, you know, I can't speak for every Haitian, but I know my experience in Brooklyn had been such that in school, when I was the person who couldn't speak English, that was a major problem. When I could speak English, then I was looked at for what I could accomplish in terms of my brain. I was a spelling bee champ, so the class loved me, you know. Um, as I got older, it also depends on your age. You know, as you become teenagers, the conflicts become a little bit differently, not just from a cultural standpoint, but from a social standpoint. Um, so at that point, then I was getting beat up, not for being Frenchy, but I was getting beat up because I was, boys were interested in me that were not interested in the other girls, okay? Um, for whatever reason. Well, um, I actually have had a great deal of experience and contact with uh, Americans who are of Caribbean descent, either born on a, an island or parents were Caribbean American. Um, either those would be of Jamaican, Cuban, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, um, Haitians. Uh, I've actually been to both Haiti, Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico. I have my uh, father actually felt that some of his um, relatives were Jamaican. So, um, so I have very um, good friends who are Jamaican and or Caribbean American. It's that I think that, you know, if you look I think most African Americans look long enough, you know, we have Caribbean roots. It is um, often how most African Americans in the South came into the United States was through the Caribbean, unless they were on a, a slave trade that landed in Virginia or, or South Carolina. But most of us in the Deep South, you know, our ancestry is through, is through the Caribbean. 
While Caribbean nationals and African Americans share some cultural and political views, including an overwhelming support for President Obama, there are some sharp distinctions and immigration is a key political issue that Caribbean nationals are concerned about. That is not much of a concern for all African Americans. I, I produced and directed a play called Interactions, and it's examining the relationship between African Americans and people from the Caribbean and you know the, the, the different uh, um, nuances you know the different uh, gestures and, and idiosyncrasies that that you can compare the two cultures with we have to we we have to work together and we are, because we here uh, we probably left the, the land of our birth and and claim well okay fine i'll probably stay about three five years and go back home and then you're here 10 15 20 40 and you still have not returned. So um, just uh, make the best of, of, of what you can where you are. As uh, the statement that Marcus Garvey made, you know, with the, the whole back to Africa uh, statement, that was misconstrued. I mean, Garvey never was uh, asking uh, all Africans to go back to Africa. No, wherever you are, you make Africa, your, your whole surrounding. And this is why I, um, and circle myself with things African, you know what I mean, the furniture and pictures and, and artifacts and because uh, I've had a chance you know, to, to go to Africa, to go to a few countries and, and to bring back that memorabilia and, and even, even stuff from, from Guyana, you know what I mean, I like to have that nostalgic feeling around me. So I, I think that's, that, that's important too uh, when someone sees that uh, at least you have not, you know, quote unquote, forgotten your roots. and and you're still immersing yourself in things that you grew up with. I think many Caribbean Americans, even when they come to the United States, sometimes live in African American communities. And if they don't live specifically in an African American community, they often live in a, in a diverse, a mixed community. So they see the, um, the different type of struggles that are, exist even here as African Americans. Also too, you know, you know, when they're in a car driving along, you know, the police see them as black just as they see them as other African Americans, so then you know the the relationship is is the same. Uh, I think the tension that sometimes that you see, you know, sometimes it's more on a social level, you know, like when they're hanging out, or as opposed to on a political level. I think the African Americans and Caribbean Americans are really on the same politically. Um, I think sometimes many African, um, more Caribbean Americans, sometimes might have more. Um, left-wing views than a lot of African Americans, you know, probably Jamaicans, you know, particularly because they're more influenced by the Rastafarian, the Marcus Garvey type of ideology. So sometimes on that level, they sometimes might gravitate to more um, black nationalist ideals that, more a that fewer African Americans are going to ascribe to, particularly those raised in the South. Maybe if they, um, if they were Jamaican, Haitian Americans, uh, um, or other members of the African the Caribbean diaspora went up north to New York, where there's a much longer tradition of Caribbean Americans who have um, been in the United States and have their own, um, I want to say, range of com developed communities in um, New Jersey and New York, where they can actually um, feel like they're actually in Kingston or in Port-au-Prince. Then there you might see that they might maintain that Caribbean identity much more than if they um, moved to Tampa, even so in Miami, because I think even in Miami, though, the, even in Miami, there are those communities. I think they assimilate much more in Miami than they would in New York. As the U.S. population is growing, the dynamics of immigration are bound to change. Second generation Caribbean American children are usually no different from their American peers whose families have been in the U.S. for multiple generations. There are some situations in their lives, however, where they find themselves facing cultural conflicts because they have to balance the demands of American culture with those of tradition-minded parents. Um, one thing I would say to families that migrate from their country and come here to the U.S., I think the first thing you need to do is find an organization that um, is your culture based. The, there are a lot of different organizations here. There is actually a Belize organization, um, and I'm very actively involved with them. And you know, every opportunity I get, I want to bring my kids to anything that's Belizean. So you know, even in my home, I only speak my Creole language to them. I refuse to speak anything else, and you know, I I just embrace my culture. So 
you should always just be proud of who you are and where you're from. I don't really think that um, the culture matters as long, like I said before, good personality is all that really matters. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or American or Canadian. It doesn't really matter as long as you have a good personality. In high school, I was involved in football, which had a couple Haitians on the team, and it was like the Haitians were always grouped off from the Americans. And even the way it was, the Americans were treated as, even though they were black Americans, they were treated sort of as like the majority and anything else that wasn't black American was a minority. So even the Hispanics on the team would hang with the Haitians. And that's how it really was. And especially at my high school, Haitians were, it was so many Haitians at the school. Like if you weren't Haitian, you weren't really cool at the school. Like nobody really cared for you or anything if you weren't Haitian at my school. So being on the football team, it was a really, it was really fun because I was a Haitian American. I was able to get along with the other Haitians there. But even then within those, that like that Haitian group you had, like I guess it would be like a subgroup and you would have the Haitians that were born in America and the Haitians that were actually born in Haiti and then came here. And those Haitians that were actually born in Haiti, I don't know what it is, but they have a certain arrogance to them. Like they're, <laughs> They had this arrogance to them, like they were better than those that were born in America, and it was, it was, it was interesting. It was really interesting. As a younger kid, not a lot of 26, 27-year-old kids can run for office and win. The Haitian American community rallied behind me. They rallied behind me because of the fact that I was a young lawyer, young Haitian American, and they say, look, we sent our kids to school to accomplish what it is Michael is accomplishing. Not a lot, I was the youngest elected in South Florida at the time because the Haitian American community allowed it. And of course, the Caribbean American community allowed it too. They, the Jamaicans, the Bahamians, and here in North Miami, the Anglos as well, they, they played their role and helped me get to where I'm at. Not every community would allow a 26, 27 year old kid to come in and be an elected official of an entire city, the fifth largest city in Dade County. I think the Haitian American community, the Caribbean American community for it. Hello, well, I'm at a school. It is uh, approximately 11.30. And right about now, I'm just waiting for my boyfriend to come pick me up. So I don't feel like walking because it's hot. For Caribbean American children and children of immigrant parents, growing up American can be a matter of smooth acceptance or of a traumatic confrontation. Immigrant children are generally eager to embrace American culture and to acquire an American identity by becoming indistinguishable from their American peers. In some cases, however, they may be perceived as unassimilated even when they try hard to abandon their own ethnic identities. In other cases, they may be accepted as well as adjusted precisely because they retain strong ethnic identities. I mean, I've, I've been in this country for so long I think that I've assimilated quite well, but you still try not to assimilate too much that you lose who you are. Like you have to assimilate in order to get ahead and meet people and just thrive in the you know American environment because this is where you live. So you want to you want to succeed here, you want to survive here, but at the same time, it's like you're still trying to hold on to who you are. You know, you try to cook the food and you try to still do everything that you feel. Um, supplement your identity for who you are. Because we very quickly will set ourselves up against others or use a term like culture clash. You know, it's this negative, there's a separation, there's a chasm between groups, whether it's between Jamaicans and Haitians, which fought all the time growing up, you know, or whether it's between all the minorities and the, there's just constant divisions, you know, obviously even within religions and between religions. So we set up these divisions and then we point the finger and say, but they discriminate against us, and we, I think, can find ourselves doing the exact same thing. It's, it's just part of being part of fallen humanity, and it's something to be careful of.
ago, this country was wide open for opportunities to move into an area and assimilate. American culture evolved into a blend of different nationalities. It is more common now for communities to become dominated by one nationality where there is less need or desire to assimilate. This leads to clashes as cultures overlap and differences in lifestyle, religion, language, and taboos become divisive. I think this project is very important in that it, it's acknowledging that even though President Obama is in the White House, that there are still some issues that need to be looked at. Um, that the contextual reality in America really is such that it can be the American dream for some, but the American nightmare for others. And that um, you're going to be increasing awareness about that. And the fact that it can also be a little bit of both. It can be a positive and a negative experience at the same time but that the individual person has to be the one that um, manages their own emotions and also manages their own achievements. And that as a person, I cannot let other people's attitudes deter me from what my objectives are. To use one last proverb that my grandmother used to say, you buy a boy while conte conte tete be flagging and just poop on it now, okay? They're not sending you to count how many tits the cow has just to get the milk. So to remain focused on what it is that, that I want to accomplish and what is it that's going to make me as an individual feel like I have done something and contributed something to the society, that's largely more important than what the context actually is. But at the same time, if I can achieve and maintain my integrity and my dignity through this process, then maybe I'm somehow softening the ground for those who will come after me, you know, as they plant their seeds and reap their own harvest. Coming from a region like the Caribbean, and this is a very, very selfish statement I'm going to make, you have to hold on to your culture. You have to um, pass on your culture to your children, to your grandchildren. They have to know where your roots are. It was always something that confused me where a country that's built by immigrants, founded by immigrants, like established by immigrants and with, you know, the Statue of Liberty and the port there that so many came into and, and fled to see, like, we're a country of immigrants and to see cultural clashes among immigrants who are from other places in a new land that wasn't even ours to begin with. But like, we're so like, claim it and proud of it and, Everyone wants Mexicans to go back home and South Florida, they'll let the Cubans in but they don't want the Haitians coming in. Like there's, you see all these negative, it's just something that was so strange to me. And maybe I'm naive or, or such an optimist, but it, it just logically it doesn't make sense that that clashing exists. So it takes many shapes and forms and can ultimately end in some, you know, extremely negative outcomes like holocausts and things like that. But. It just doesn't make sense to me. It's still something that just, it's so confusing. Effective immediately, the Department of Homeland Security is taking steps to lift the shadow of deportation from these young people. Over the next few months, eligible individuals who do not present a risk to national security or public safety will be able to request temporary relief from deportation proceedings and apply for work authorization. Now, let's be clear, this is not amnesty. This is not immunity. This is not a path to citizenship. It's not a permanent fix. This is a temporary stopgap measure that lets us focus our resources wisely while giving a degree of relief and hope to talented, driven, patriotic young people.